I wasn't going to film today, but I came across a video on YouTube. And just by reading the title and seeing the thumbnail, it looked very interesting. And this is a type of video that I have not reacted to, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it a shot. Thank you to everyone who clicked onto this video. I am happy to see that you are interested in watching a video like this because it is important and it does affect a lot of people's lives in America. So we're gonna get straight to it. This is a 22 minute video. Emmanuel Eko, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, uploaded a video called A Conversation with the Police, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, episode nine. This was posted a couple months back, but I just came across it right now. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right to it. Are y'all ready to react? Cause I am. Let's get it. He's nervous. I'm assuming that's Emmanuel. Oh, man. What's happening? All is good. Here they come. All good. The men in they're blue. Men. But they're actually in black. <laughs> but the men in blue, y'all know what that is. Here we go. I love this concept, by the way. Petaluma, California. Sorry, I have to pause it. California has a total population of 60,000 people. Less than 1% of those people are black. Welcome to another episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. So much of the dissension in our world, so much of the dissension in America is based around the interaction between police officers, white police officers, and black people. Whether George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake, Jonathan Price, and so, so many more. So I, a black man, am eager yet anxious to be joined by the Petaluma Police Department. For the first time, Sad. with a live audience of lieutenants, Ooh. officers, Ooh. and administration. Ooh. Now out of an abundance of caution. Okay, just by that alone, how does that make you feel, Emmanuel? Being in a room full of cops, I don't know what your experiences are. Being a black man in society usually is not a good experience. How does it feel to have the audience filled with lieutenants and sergeants <laughs> looking at you? This kind of reminds me of how it really is out there in the streets when all these cops are targeting you just because you're a black man. So this is an interesting setup all been COVID tested within the past 48 hours. I know so many of you are wondering, Emmanuel, why Petaluma? Uh, there, there isn't a notorious uh, black violence with police, white police officers. And to mm. that, I simply submit, we weren't talking about Kenosha until after Jacob Blake was shot. We weren't talking about Wolf City, Texas until after Jonathan Price lost his life okay. to a man in uniform. I fervently believe that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. I agree. So that's why I'm here. Joining me on stage is uh, Ryan McGreevy, Brendan McGovern, Garrett Laviano, and John Antonio. Gentlemen, how are you? Doing great. great. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us. Of course, of course. Now, look. And thank you to these cops who are actually taking the time and effort to be part of the change. And this is a step. I will say that, so thank you for putting yourselves in an uncomfortable conversation. Comfortable. Ryan, <laughs> when was the last time you had black people over at your house for dinner? Well, before COVID, I'll tell you that. Um, I Be don't honest. know, I, can't, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I'd ask you the same question. Well, like, when was the last time you sat down just to have a conversation uh, with a group of black people, Garrett? I can be honest with you, I don't, I don't know that I've ever had a conversation with a group of black people. Yeah, I would say that proximity breeds care and distance breeds fear. Proximity breeds care and distance breeds fear. And I think one of the issues mm. in our society is like that. there's not enough proximity between people who don't look like each other. Mm. And because there's not enough proximity, there's a lack of care or a lack of empathy. And mm -hmm. there is a heightened amount. Mm -hmm. When you see the things occurring in our worlds, like what happened with George Floyd, a black man 
losing his life uh, to these white police officers. When you first saw that video, what went through your mind? I mean, I felt sick. Uh, it's difficult to, to have to show up and know that we get paid to do this and then having to see what people see on TV and they don't necessarily see, uh, see the person, they just see the uniform and they associate that with us. So every time I see something like that, I know that I'm about to get bombarded by phone calls and text messages. For sure. Why did this happen? What's going For on? For sure. Ryan, let me go to you. Is there enough accountability in the police force when mistakes happen? Mm. Or are they held responsible? Let's hear that. I want ah, to know. That's tough to answer on a national standpoint. I mean, if you look at um, George Floyd incident, that officer was terminated, arrested, charged like immediately, uh, which I think is a <laughs> that only happened because that incident was filmed. Social media was flooded with these videos to the point where it got the news to shed light on this. That is the only reason why it was quick accountability and quick action from the police department. I promise you that. Appropriate, right? So in that regard, obviously it's a tragic incident and you hope that that doesn't happen. I, I would say that just generally speaking, yeah, there probably is some issues with officer accountability throughout the country. What does justice look like to you in these situations? I think justice looks like uh, decisive and equal punishment. The issue at hand, I feel like, is that the, the punishment for officers doesn't necessarily match the crime. Right. If you are caught in, in, in a doctor's office and there's malpractice and someone dies, don't be disbarred. It's not like, ah, oh, well, I got I need to know this, I need to know that. It doesn't, it doesn't fit. Whereas instantly, especially right now, when we see so many things going on with excessive force over black people, we're instantly like, ah, oh, well, look at his criminal history. Uh -huh. Oh, well, he didn't graduate from college. Uh -huh. Well, he lied back in seventh grade. Right. It instantly goes to character defamation. Yeah. Let's see to if the we victim. can protect the people in the back. To the victim. So, Mind you, the victim is the person that was killed by the officer. Instead of shedding the attention on the officer that created the crime, they put the attention on the victim and try to discredit them as a person and try to tarnish the reputation. That is a fucking problem. Just for me, just looks like a punishment that fits the crime because there's always that phrase, who's gonna police the police? Mm -hmm. And right now the answer has been no one. No one. Not but even the president. See uh, a life not even the fucking situation. president. Sorry guys, my space bar is not working. The death situation occurred on the job. How hard is that to recover from? Whether it's just your knowledge of someone who may have been involved or if you've personally been involved, how hard is that to recover from emotionally, psychologically? It is incredibly difficult to recover from. Um, even from that standpoint, uh, being I've been doing this for 13 years, I've been in situations not obviously identical to that, but similar. Uh, that's never ever going to leave their mind. It's going to change the outcome of everything they do from this point on. Of course. I mean, there are situations As where those people and they'll die later, and you still—that's it, your—it's your attachment. You you brought them to this point, and from my own personal incidents, I don't. It's changed me uh, for the duration of my life. I don't ever see it going back. As it should. John, you retired from the police force. Do you think that you can ever become desensitized to death wearing a badge? I've thought about this. And I think you can, you feel like you're in control when you're a police officer, but then you don't have control. Mm -hmm. That's when it really affects you and obviously kids. Before I had kids, I don't think I would have been affected as bad. But uh, no, I mean, we're human. We, we don't change and, and get in our locker at night and sleep there and then jump out, <laughs> you know. A lot of people think that, you know. Yeah. So, um, Brendan, would you say that there is a difference, especially in a city like Petaluma, which is less than 1% black, in how you or those you know approach a situation when it is a black suspect versus a white suspect be honest yes. um we again we deal with white suspects frequently we deal with black suspects frequently as well but when i show up and i do hear say black male adult a part of me knows that the public's perception of what is about to take place is going to be much different than if if he got described you know, saying stealing a, a beer from a 7-Eleven as opposed to you stealing a beer from that a 7-Eleven. That is true. I already know. That is true. And I'm trying to look at everyone's perspective. 
everyone's side. Especially coming from an officer who is not racist, who is not prejudiced, who tries to do his best to follow the law. Knowing that he got a call where there is a person of color involved, most likely there's gonna be people around that are gonna be on the defense and are going to start filming because of incidences that, that has happened in the country. It's gonna be a different situation if it was a white person. I feel like they're gonna be on guard. That twice as many eyes are gonna be on me when I contact you as opposed to him. So does that change how you treat the situation because you know that it is a more delicate situation? Right, more delicate, yes. that's a good way to put it. I have you know, the rules that I go by, my morals, my ethics. It's not gonna change the way that I necessarily talk to you or order you around. I might choose my words differently, I might choose the way that I handle myself or approach you differently because I don't wanna seem like the, you know, the, the giant white officer mm -hmm. trying to, you know, force myself upon the, the black male suspect that the public wants to see. Film ourselves, obviously, but I know that someone's gonna be filming the interaction, so I'm going to be choosing the way I react differently. Brennan, let me ask you, how do you deal with the pressure of knowing you have to be perfect? They want us to be perfect. I don't necessarily see that we can show up and be perfect. We get that domestic violence call, we know that there's a man and a woman, and then we show up and, you know, the woman's not wearing clothes and the man is you know holding a baseball bat we have to make too many decisions for me to be able to say that everything we mm -hmm. do will be the perfect way that we do it right 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 john you coach high school football now yes but now that you don't have to don the uniform on yeah. a daily basis do you feel a weight lifted off your life 100 percent. when i finally was done i was so like relieved i actually started sleeping again uh, started going to the gym again. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad to be out of it. And I feel bad because wow. I feel like I should still be there with the with your teammates, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's like uh, going down, getting injured in a game and, and not being able to help your teammates. But um, I'm happy about, about being out of it, yeah. Nick, if I may ask you from the audience, Here we you are a traffic officer, is there anything that you would want to communicate or feel the need to communicate based off the fact that racial tension does in fact exist currently in America. We do things systematically. We do things the same way every time because it's repeatable and we could testify to it. So to answer your question, no, we, we don't approach that differently, um, or at least the people that I supervise do not approach that differently, but maybe we should. I've dealt with situations, I'm sure others in the room can, can speak to this as well. As we show up on scene with a, a person of color and we're immediately hit with, you're only stopping me because I'm X, right? That's true. Um, and and That's it true. becomes a barrier to communication because we And I will say perfect. this, and that is what bothers me sometimes, is when you pull out the black card. A lot of the times, yes, they most likely are pulling you over because you are a person of color in a probably nice vehicle and it looks suspicious to that white officer. That's fucked up. But then there's also other situations, like they literally just pulled you over because you just ran a red light. You're gonna go straight to, oh, you're only pulling me over because I'm black. When you know damn well that you ran through that red light. And it could honestly be because you really do believe that they pulled you over because of that reason. It can also be because you've experienced so much negative interaction with cops. And so of course this is naturally gonna be first thing that crosses your mind. Or you just wanna pull that card because it's gonna make the officer question himself and why he's pulling you over. And so you're gonna use it for your benefit. There's many reasons for a person to think this way. And I think every situation is different. And every person is different. Legitimate purpose, how do we disarm that? How do, how do we get around that? It's a really good question. Um, when you step onto the scene, as, as, as a black man, obviously I'm just gonna be upset that I'm being stopped in the first place. Right, just like but anybody else. it's just a matter of maintaining the composure, maintaining the calm, and continuing to assert exactly why it is that you are there. Mm. Mm. If we could do a better job of like disarming, that. then we wouldn't have to worry about discharging. Facts. And, and I think that's where we lack. Mm. There's a communication barrier. And I always say that. That's why I'm so eager to talk to y'all from Pet uh, Petaluma. And that's a great point that he just pointed out. You are a trained officer. You are trained to calm an aggressive situation. I'm sure that when a person that you pulled over tells you that, it's going to trigger something inside you. It's going to anger you. It's going to upset you because that's not really why you're pulling them over, right? But instead of taking control of the situation by calming the suspect, a lot of these cops get aggressive. They show their anger. They show their human side. But mind you, they are not just any person from off the street. 
They are trained officers. They have been given the tools to calm the situation, but a lot of them refuse to use it. And so then when you become angry and upset and authoritative, you want to show your power and you make the situation a lot worse than where it should be. You don't grow up around something, then you're not really going to know how to communicate with that thing. And mm -hmm. it's not the same. Mm -hmm. Communicating with a white cultured person versus a black cultured person is different. Very I different. would submit that 90% of black people in the last five months have gone through a tragic experience. Mm. We all have in witnessing the murder of George Floyd. But it is different for black people because they can literally see themselves right. as that person. Or their loved you one. You can't fix a problem you don't know exists. I'm letting you know it exists. So now let's just all work to fix it. I have a question. Do police officers make you nervous? Heck yes. <laughs> now, what if it was a black police officer? Nah, it's different. So, black people often navigate white spaces as a foreigner. As I sit in this room, I'm one of three black people in here. You sit in this room and you're one of 35 white people in here. Uh, it's, it's natural for you. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're home. Yep. Whenever I walk into a room, a restaurant, mm. church, anywhere, I'm looking for black people. Just in case something pops off, mm. it's like, okay, we here. <laughs> Me and you, mm. like, we, we're, we're together. Because so many black people in life have probably gone through some sort of struggle, there's an instant connection. Mm -hmm. It makes you relax a little bit less, a little bit more. Or, yeah. Or, you're it, still dealing with a cop, so you're nervous naturally. But if, There's if, more if, of a relation. If I can now be honest, I see he's black before I see he's a cop. Right. Uh. I see you all are cops first. Yep. Yep, yep. And Nick, I'll go back to you. How do you feel when you hear the phrase Black Lives Matter? Oh, here we go. Black lives do matter. This is we sensitive. Need to pay attention to some of the injustices that have happened over, you know, the last hundred years and beyond. Where Black Lives Matter becomes confusing is when it becomes very divisive. Right now, in the midst of a political election, there's questions on whether Black Lives Matter is a so, uh, social movement or is it a campaign? Something political. And I think when right. we pass the November elections, I think we need to focus on continuing it as a movement so we can create a, a successful outcome. Because if it ends on the election, then it was just a campaign. You have some on Yeah, I mean, uh, so the blue Lives Matter flag, right? The blue line, either on a flag or it's black, blue, black. Um, okay, hold on. I, I, mm. Oh, this is a sensitive subject because the whole Blue Lives Matter term is stupid as fuck. That's not even a fucking movement. I'm sorry for my swear words, but I get a little bit passionate with stuff like this. Blue Lives? Who the fuck is blue? That's a damn uniform, not the person themselves. So there is no such thing as Blue Lives Matter. Has taken on kind of a life of its own. Politically, currently, it's obviously flying on, on one side of the political boundary as opposed to the other. So when you see that, what do you see? Ooh, let's hear this. I feel frustrated because I feel as though the agenda is being moved. Right. Here's what I mean by right. that. To say any life matters is to assert that we thought that life didn't matter. So to say that blue lives matter would to then assert that historically we've acted as though cops' lives don't matter. Right. Whereas Right, black right, right. lives matter historically right, right. we have literally acted as though black lives don't matter mm -hmm. all men are created equal 17 late 1700s we donned that phrase they weren't talking about black men weren't talking about black women mm. weren't talking about women but we said all men that's what the fuck i'm saying all men are created equal what the fuck are you talking about since when even when they wrote that there was no equality it was the worst at that time and it's still bad Till this day, there's no such thing. Let's be real with ourselves, America. Let's not try to portray this country to be the best country in the world when it's not. It's better than a lot, but it's not the best. Great and equal. So now it's like, wait a second. Just in case they're not talking about us this time, let's make sure we specify that Black Lives Matter. Right. Ryan, earlier you mentioned preparation and you talked about funding and you talked about preparing as a unit to step onto the scene. What do you feel when you hear the phrase defund the police? Uh, I think it means different things to different people. People who, who feel that want to literally take some of the responsibility we have as police officers and move it to somebody else. I'll be first in line to sign up for that. Like, go ahead, that's great, that's a great idea. So we get a lot of calls 
with people who have mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. Who's going to go to those calls? If, if you have somebody that, that, that is able and willing to go to them, that's great. The, the problem is it's not black and white where it's like, oh, these are just mental health calls. If you have a mental health call with somebody and they have a knife, we, the, the social worker's not going to go. Once we make the scene safe, then we call them and say, hey, uh, I got you know, so-and-so down here. Can you come down here and, and talk to them and, um, and kind of work through their, their issues? But defund the police doesn't upset you when you hear it. Abolish the police upsets me, but defund somebody else can handle these, some of this stuff. I'm all for it. That's interesting. I hadn't heard it like that before. I mean, I, 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 for a long time, I didn't know how to process it. I didn't know how to take it. When I hear the defund thing, I feel like some of our communities are abandoning us. Prior to May 2020 and George Floyd, uh, we were in the midst of a pandemic. We were doing the best we can for our community. People were showing up to the station, bringing us treats. We were heroes. After that, they wanted to defund us. It hurts. Why does it hurt? Because I feel like for, for 15 years uh, we've made, and I can speak to you know, all my partners in the room, uh, we, we've made a lot of sacrifices to be a part of the community, to try to help people. And it felt like people were turning their backs on us. Uh, we're not perfect. Uh, but I don't think we're at a point where we can just abandon what we've built. We want to be a part of the solution. Uh, we want to, we understand that the relationships are important and inherently it's about trust. Can you speak to that? Because you are actively in the field. How it makes you feel knowing you're sacrificing every day in the field, but then you might come home and see on the news or see on social media that defund the police is being chanted around the world. How does that make you feel? So my initial response was visceral and, and it made me upset. Moving forward, uh, looking into what actually defunding the police is, defunding the police is not abolishing the police or getting mm -hmm. rid of the police. It's mm -hmm. restructuring policing in America. Right. Two weeks ago, I was doing traffic control for a women's rally protest in March in the city of Petaluma. Many of the occupants of the rally had signs defund the police. The interesting thing with our community is while they're holding signs, chanting defund the police, they're walking over and saying, thank you for your services and thank you for being out here. Right. That's kind of a paradigm shift and threw me for a, a loop when somebody is coming and thanking me while they're holding a sign that I'm supposed to be offended by. Again, it comes down to, to communication and dialogue and mm -hmm. creating that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a scary term anymore. Right. It upset them because they were ignorant to what that really meant. If you guys actually informed yourself and what we mean when we say defunding the police, then you wouldn't be so upset. And this is why ignorance is dangerous. A lot of this stuff would not be happening if, if you filled yourself with knowledge. Now, on a more broad scale, if you could communicate a more public message to black children who live in fear of the police, mm. what would you, Brandon McGovern, say? That's, a, that's incredibly difficult for me to say because all, all communities are different, but from an umbrella standpoint, um, we're here for you, right? Look at, it, look, we, we, we look at us like a teacher, look at us like a counselor. Like We want to be the person that you, you call, the person that when we show up, you run to us. It's like we're not there to be mean. We're there because we're here to help. And uh, I want all of the kids to know, I mean, it's a black kids in particular pertaining to this, is like, we're, we're there, we're here to help you. And we're, I'm, I'm sorry that this is currently what you see us as. You think we'll ever get to that point? Uh, where black children look to cops as helpers as opposed to, uh, as, as the enemy? I'm sorry, I don't. There has been progress the last couple decades, but it still exists. Do I ever see it going away? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. This world is fucked up. It just is. We can try our best to make it better. But child? Mm. In my lifetime, no. It right. has come in waves and it has disappeared, and now it's back, right? It hides. Mm -hmm. And it only takes a George Floyd or something else to, to bring it back. I don't know how we can get rid of it. How do we abolish racism? How do we abolish, you know, right. violent police tendencies? It's, I, I don't know. Gary, you seem like more of an optimist. It would always exist. How would you answer that question? Do you think we could ever get rid of the notion that black children are growing up in America viewing police officers as threats and as the enemy? I do. You know, and you know, I am an optimist. We're completely bombarded in the media with some of these, these incidents that are happening are terrible. Um, but that's not the overwhelming majority of the police contacts that we have throughout the community. For example, last year we had 60,000 calls for service. 2,000 arrests and only 48 of them resulted in a use of force. So what the reality is, is that 
we're having a lot of positive interactions my question, with people. Sorry, my question with that is, was 48 of them people of color? Um, it's just how do we portray that? How do we get it out there to let people know that that is in fact the case? There is going to be unfortunate incidents. I don't think we're going to get away from that. It's just how we deal with those when they come up. That's good. I think people underestimate the fact of just because y'all are in uniform does not mean that y'all are not human. Yes, right, y'all right, are right. held to a higher standard mm -hmm. because y'all are the front-facing uh, aspects of the government, but y'all are not exempt. You brought up a, a question earlier about the black kid running up to the white police officer, right? I want to be the person that somebody comes running up to, high fives, looks for guidance and so forth. How does a white officer in America make that, bridge that gap so that a black juvenile will look to them as a role model, as a person that is mm. positive in the community? That's a really good question. I like that officer. I think first you do it on an individual level. I'm gonna say this, I like this officer because I feel like he's being very genuine. Just the direct eye contact, the way he's speaking with confidence, you can tell that he means what he says. He might be one of those good officers. To permeate society. There is a reason whenever you see a cop playing a sport with somebody in the neighborhood, the video goes viral. Because it's like a far-fetched idea. Bad news sells way better than good news. We don't do a good enough job True. collectively as a country is letting the good news resonate. So you do it on an individual level until it be, begins to become Become somewhat a of a societal thing. Mm -hmm. Because all it takes is one George Floyd situation mm. to undermine the entire situation. Mm -hmm. John, what would you say this dialogue has done for you? I think it's opened up a different perspective of maybe what certain people might feel or the way they look at police officers, really, I think that they will see that we're human. Uh, but I also think that it's opened our eyes to say, hey, look, um, there is this major problem in this country. I think back about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee and how when that started, I was, I was pissed. I was like, are you kidding me right here? Like, this felt like a, a shot to us. Not understanding and why. And as things progressed and you started seeing things mm -hmm. in the country, it wasn't until mm -hmm. I just watched a movie, it's called Chicago 7, I don't know if you've seen it, that it clicked in my mind. Yes, that's I not have. a shot at me. That's a shot at the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brennan, what would you say the conversation uh, has done for you for dialogue? I wish we could have this conversation with anybody who wants to. And I hope that obviously in this venue that people see it and they realize that, hey, if they want to come talk to us, they can. We can't be part of the solution if we're part of the problem. So you bringing us on here um, has at least, you know, opened the door. For sure. Garrett, how would you say it's, uh, if it all opened your eyes? Yeah, I think gaining some situational awareness and when you talk about how we're perceived by black people when we show up on scene, having an understanding of, of the difference there is, is very important, um, can, can lead us to um, removing some barriers to communication, which ultimately uh, we want to have. Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, all I have to say is thank y'all. Thank y'all for your service. Thank you for the dialogue. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you all, men, women alike, uh, for, for listening. I think that this is what we need more of. And thank y'all for, sure. for tuning in to another episode of Uncomfortable Conversation. You are more than welcome. Black man, if we are going to achieve racial reconciliation in our world, it starts with our police officers, it starts with our black men and women, it starts with white people, black people having conversations and coming together for the betterment of the world around us. We'll see you next time. All right. I like it, I like it. I subscribe to his channel just to see what kind of other uncomfortable conversations he's got going on. Tell me what you thought about this video. Should I do more videos on serious topics like these? Because I am passionate. I do believe that YouTube is a great platform to talk about things like this. Comment below and let me know. All right, you guys, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe, and please hit that bell so you can get notified every time I upload. See you in the next video. Peace.